Welcome back to the Marshan and Orion Sports Media Podcast. As we look ahead to 2022, uh, we're going to do a normal show where we go who's up, who's down, all the topics. Uh, and then we're going to have calls of the week, but calls of the week are going to be predictions. And I already know what John's is, and it is a mammoth prediction. So you're going to want to wait till the end. John, looking forward to the next year uh, doing this podcast with you. Uh, so let's get started right away. Who do you have as up? for 2022 who's up who's down who's up we've been talking about this for the past several pods andrew my who's up is lenny daniels lenny daniels is a president of turner sports and he is about to get so much money and have so many more toys to play with over at turner sports all because in the first quarter probably of this year the federal government is going to okay the merger between Discovery and Warner Media, and that's going to put David Zaslov, a guy that knows sports, loves sports, has already used sports over in Europe as a way to build up uh, his, his media companies over there. He's going to be overseeing Warner Media uh, almost certainly. This hasn't been announced yet, but it's almost certainly to happen because he, he's very close to, to Zaslov. Jeff Zucker is going to stick around overseeing uh, the, the sports division as well as as well as news. He's a big believer in sports. They're going to be involved in every single rights deal that comes up. They're going to be throwing a lot of money at them in order to try to collect as many as they can. And they're going to be a big, big player in sports. Watch that space. Who's down for 2022? Uh, who's down? It's got to be Rob Manfred. I, already, there's a lockout. Rob Manfred, of course, is the Major League Baseball commissioner. Already, the uh, baseball owners have locked out the players. I don't think we're going to see baseball on opening day. Even if we do, he's going to go through a spring of labor negotiations, just the toughest part of any, any uh, commissioner's job ever, try, trying, trying to uh, bridge a gap there. And let's just say he gets that. Then he has to turn around and he has to deal with all the problems with Sinclair and the RSNs, a big, huge revenue stream for all of his teams. He has nothing but very big issues coming up on his plate and good luck to him if he if he solves them all I, I i see rob is on the way down for this year and you know what i'm just gonna hop on the back of that and do my who's down uh and i have rsn's the regional sports networks um i was tempted to say chris ripley the head of sinclair who that's John, my thing andrew that's my thing <laughs> that does that every week I, i've never even heard of chris ripley before we started this podcast every week now I, he's in my mind this guy is just getting torched by john oran but look he's the, he's the one in charge of the regional sports networks we see where i think espn is going to be fine on a national level uh but the rsn's are going to uh are going to have another tough year. And it's a, a question that we're going to talk about a little bit further and go deeper into, are they going to disintegrate here in 2022 or do they have a little leeway? And let me do my who's up. Uh, big money, big talent. Uh, we saw this past year, Pat McAfee, $30 million deal per year with FanDuel. Stevie A gets $12 million. I think those big time stars are going to continue to see their uh, salaries escalate because of the gambling money specifically that's coming in. That's going to make those salaries uh, bloat. Uh, I think ESPN is going to have a question if they're going to keep cutting. And I, and I know they've picked their spots. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit later as well. But I do think that uh, these big salaries are not going away in 2022. I just have to say you're who's up your who's down. You pick these themes as up and down. I actually go after the people as up and down. I mean, who are you going to put? Uh, who is up in terms of the big money? Who's going to get? We're going to get money into that. Down? We have that as a topic. I, I okay, give go, me one name. One name for who's up. All right, I'm going to go Big Cat. I think now he has some ownership stake, I believe, in Barstool, but I think he's well positioned uh, to make a killing if he were to leave again. I'm not sure how his contract and how that all works out. Because like I said, I think uh, he might be happy and have some ownership stake there. So it might just be worth it for him to, to stay with Barstool and, and do his thing there. But I think he's a guy, when you look at where his podcast with uh, PFT commenter is situated uh, in terms of either the number one sports podcast or top five sports media podcast. I think he's well situated. Dan Katz is his real name. Uh, I think he's a guy that I would look to who could, could 
have a big score uh, if he were uh, to to leave Barstool or at least use uh, leverage uh, to get even a bigger amount of money. Just you look at what's ha- happened in the podcast space and and he and PFT commenter uh, Eric Solenberger are really at the top of that heap. Uh, and so I'm sure they're doing well right now, but I think they could do even better. All right, John, topic number one, the NFL. Uh, as we go into 2022, a uh, lot of big things. Uh, number one, uh, Amazon is going to have the exclusive rights to Thursday night football. That will come up in the fall when they take over uh, Thursday night, who will be broadcasting. We've talked about Al Michaels being the leading candidate for play-by-play, who will be his analyst. Uh, there are three people that I've reported for a long time that are at the top of the list. Troy Aikman, Chris Collinsworth, Drew Brees, and mystery candidate, maybe a possible coach. Uh, and then, you know, if, if Aikman were to go to Amazon, that would open up a spot at Fox. They have a Super Bowl coming up. I don't think he's leaving most likely, but you never know. So just look at the NFL. Um, John, where, where do you want to take it? Where, where do you th- see things in 2022 with the NFL and television? Yeah, I want to stick with Amazon for a second because I, they're about to hire a whole bunch of people to take over their studio show, to take to take over uh, actually announcing the main feed of the game. They're taking a look at you know, the Tony Romo effect and the Greg Olson effect, and they they feel like they want to get young. And and so as opposed to Al Michaels, who's just a legendary voice coming in, I would look for the, the per- person next to him to be somebody who's who's young, like Drew Brees, who is can can actually get into the booth and say, you know, I played against these guys, I played against this defense, and this is what's going to happen. I think if you take a look at their studio show, they're going to do the same thing. They're just going to try to get as many recently retired players as they can to actually talk about what it was like to uh, to, to play against people, and it's going to be a noticeable difference be- between. I mean, the Fox's NFL pregame show is is among the best in the business, of course, but it's a uh, it's old. Like they they haven't played anybody. None of those people have played anybody that that, that that's playing in the game uh, today. Played against them. Same thing with a uh, with the C, uh, CBS, and I think that that's going to be a point of differentiation with Amazon. Yeah, it could end up being Drew Brees um, with Al Michaels. I don't I don't think Al really wants to uh, break in. An analyst now, Breeze will have one year under his belt, uh, and I think you know, Breeze is interesting because he, he, if he were, if he played one more year, which he could have, he'd be even, a, you know, he'd be the guy coming out of that everyone would want. Uh, he did have interest from Monday Night Football and NBC, uh, so uh, I could see that. I also could see Aikman. Yeah, I do think Amazon wants to do something a little bit different and 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 put their own stamp on it. Uh, but they want the credibility of Al Michaels. There's some people very high up at Amazon who really like the idea of Al as the play-by-play guy. And the other thing about Amazon's broadcast, they're going to have all these ancillary feeds, just like ESPN has now in Monday Night Football with the Manning cast, and they've done forever with uh, the Mega cast. Yeah, coaches shows things. I th- one thing I'm going to be looking for, everybody's going to be trying their own Manning cast. What's it going to look like? And how are they going to do it? Within the NFL uh, broadcasters, you have two schools of thought. You have uh, uh, NBC and CBS, which are streaming their games on Peacock and on Paramount+. Plus. You have Fox and ESPN, which are really trying to save the cable bundle, and they're not streaming it nearly as much in terms of the live, live NFL games. The NFL is a point of demarcation for them. Two different strategies. Uh, if, it were, if it were me and I was advising, I would... Uh, I would want to try to make the cable bundle last as long as possible. And I'd probably be doing what Fox and ESPN are doing. Uh, but I, that, that's something that, you know, as, as a reporter, I'm looking to see what's going to work, what the NFL likes better, and, and what, if anything, is going to stop the slide of cord cutting. Yeah, and CBS does have Nate Burleson, who's their up-and-coming star. And they also did do the alternative broadcast, which they'll continue uh, early in the year with the Nickelodeon broadcast with Burleson and Noah Eagle. All right, let's move the topic to the impact of gambling on sports media. John, where do you want to take it? You know, uh, you mentioned Big Cat earlier. You're going to see increasingly uh, these gambling companies going after big time talent, but it's going to be different talent than than they had been going after. They're going to go after information people. Adam Schefter, uh, Woj, 
These are people that are going to be first ones out with who's injured, who's getting traded. And if you're a gambling company and you're trying to bring in gamblers and you have that sort of drawing people into your gambling system, that's what they want. They're not really looking for journalists. They're not really looking for storytellers. They're looking for real big information people that are going to uh, bring people into their walled garden. Yeah, for my Post Plus newsletter last couple of weeks, I had done... Um you know, went deep into FanDuel and DraftKings. And the one big takeaway, I think, from both of them is they want to be at the head of the conversation uh, for these uh, things. And I think when you look at a Woj, you look at a Schefter, the conversation a lot of times uh, starts with their reporting and when they break a transaction story, especially. um, And they do other stories as well. But I, I do think you look at their social following, I do think there seems to be a fit there. Now, I also believe that what could happen is you're employed by ESPN and then you have a gambling deal as well, that that's how people are really going to make the big money. And ESPN, as we've discussed before, is likely going to make a billion dollar deal with uh, a sports betting uh, operation. And so does that money get trickled down uh, to these big stars? I can see Scott Van Pelt, another guy who uh, should, should get a big raise, uh, you know, I think he's in the near $4 million range. Uh, could he be making a lot more, especially when you compare uh, to some of the other salaries now out there? It's a lot of money, but uh, but I could see him getting more. And so and he's kind of in that uh, popular and social, does the bad beats, associated with gambling. But I don't. So I think it's twofold, and I think they're trying to figure out what they're doing exactly. But that's going to continue to be an exploding story. Let's go. Next topic, topic three let's just get into these deals that are going to come up this year. I'm going to throw a couple out there. You tell me where they're going to go, what you're thinking. And, and I'll chime in um, except on F1. I have no idea about that one. All right. Sunday ticket. Uh, what do you, <laughs> all right. Sunday ticket. Where do you have it going? Sunday ticket. I have direct TV keeping a part of it. Uh, I know direct TV wants it. I know uh, the NFL wants to keep with direct TV. The only potential snag is if one of the streamers, decides to pay so much for exclusivity, then that'll uh, keep DirecTV out of it. But I I don't see that happening. The other side of it, it's a two horse race, Amazon, ESPN. I I have it going to ESPN. I just think that Disney CEO, Bob Capick is putting his neck out on the line saying that they want Sunday ticket. They have $33 billion to spend on programming at Disney uh, next year. I, I just, I don't see Disney ESPN losing Sunday ticket, which would then go as a premium product on ESPN plus. You love that JPEG 33 billion ESPN thing. I do. Cannot stand it. I was like, here's 33 the- billion. I, I couldn't get it. With that. Amazon, they can spend whatever they want, as we've talked about. Um, we've got we've done a lot on Amazon this this year during this first uh Baker's dozen of podcasts. I will say this, I don't know. But I do. I think you have, you're nailing it in terms of who it's going to be. I do think Directv keeps their piece or the bars. Uh, I don't know if I think they they don't have an easy solution if they don't have that component of it. Uh, and then uh, I could see Amazon's about to, as you predicted, and I've you know said as well. We think Amazon's going to take that 49 percent piece of NFL Network. Kind of makes sense to increase that partnership. Uh, Amazon really does a great job of selling these things. They have a wider audience with Prime as compared to ESPN Plus. I've just talked to myself. I'm going to say Amazon just to go the opposite of you. I also think they could they could split it, couldn't they? Can they both get it? Amazon and uh, well, I, I guess they could, but then they would they would each pay a lot less, of course. You're basically just selling something, so um, it would make sense they could just sell it. Yeah, I, I, I suppose that that is an option. I don't see it as, as a really viable option for for either one. And I don't know, I don't know if you could hear that in the background, but my Amazon Alexa just like did a little ding 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 about a notification yeah. just when I was saying that. Like I, I would like <laughs> to act like we did that on purpose, but I actually that thing is bugged. That thing is definitely bugged. They they heard it and they're like ding ding ding. Maybe Marie they Donahue is now like writing out a memo to staff. This is what Marshan says. <laughs> they're like listening. The Alexa, ay, ay, ay. Uh, but it did it goes. I, I said Amazon and said they're going, they goes ding ding ding. 
notification. I don't know. I got a guess what? I got another package. It's just in like everyone else. You probably don't even, you don't even buy anything from Amazon. You don't like them so much. They not, yeah. They never come to my house. <laughs> you like you some third party. You're all I, love it. I love Amazon. I just think, it, I think you're overstating Amazon strategy. Amazon strategy is not to be a big thing in sports. It's to targetedly go, go in there and get different. Um, We're going to move on to the, we're not going to spend, because we spent a lot of time on this. We I, we did, too much, too but much. I want to say one thing. If they have Thursday night football next year, they buy 49% of the NFL network and they get Sunday ticket. Will they be a big thing in sports? Yes, they'll be a huge thing with the NFL. Okay. Which is the biggest sport. Okay. You can almost argue the most important by far TV sport. They, they're they're going to have the worst package, NFL uh, TV package. They're going to get a, a, a half of a network that is suffering from cord cutting more than any other network that's out there. Yeah, but yeah, they'll, they'll be big. They'll be big. You act like you just show up and you get the Super Bowl. It's the most valuable <laughs> property in it's the Amazon. Most valuable they, property. They didn't show up. They've been around for decades. Ugh. Not doing this. All right. All right. We've done enough. Well, that'll be a big topic. 2022. Uh, big 10. Where do you, where do they go? Uh, big 10. They like ESPN. They don't love ESPN because they feel like ESPN is totally in bed with their biggest rival, the SEC. So I see the big 10 leaving ESPN I see them increasing what they do with uh, with Fox. Uh, so Fox is going to get more games. And I think there's going to be a big bidding war between NBC, CBS, and Warner Media. Um, my prediction is that CBS, which is going to be losing the SEC on Saturday afternoon, is going to pay up big time to get the Big Ten into that window. Okay, so it's a Fox-CBS combo. Right. I like that prediction. I'm going to go with you with that one i kind of i really like uh where you're going with that i think it makes a lot of sense all right mls uh what happens there uh i'm not bullish on mls again the way they have the rights where you'll be able to um smother them all in the local rights the national right and their big games all in one package they get about 90 million dollars uh in national uh fees for television uh, for their games. Uh, I think the, obviously they're going to go, it's going to be higher. I just don't think they're going to do great. Uh, I, I'll probably, let me go first a little bit here. I'm going to say ESPN plus does retain it, but again, they're not going to do it at a crazy number. I just don't see it with the uh, soccer is very popular, but like I've said previously, I don't know if MLS, if there's enough soccer fans who aren't buying these streaming services for something else, they're going to be brought in because of MLS. I just think if you like La Liga, you're already there for La Liga. And then, okay, MLS is there. I don't know how many just MLS fans who, again, MLS is popular in terms of going to the games, but in terms of watching them, you look at the ratings, they're not that popular. MLS for this round is going to be more about streaming than it is about television. They can't run away from their television numbers. They're, they're, they're pretty low. And so you're uh, you're going to see ESPN, they love the local rights. Uh, they, they like the out-of-market rights. Uh, so you're, I think you're going to see ESPN bidding and, and, and keeping MLS. They double? What do you get to? You're at 90 million now. What do you got them at? 180? I mean, you got to get more because you're getting the local rights. They'll say it like this, but do they get in the 200 million? That's where I think, again, I don't think that's a great, in comparison to other deals, I don't think it's a great number, but it's not you know, we have an, uh, If we do an over under, we would have it at 200 million. MLS oh, would say- listen, we're going to play over under, over under. 2020. <laughs> I'm going to put the number out and John's going to say over under. We're going to bet another dinner. So far, he owes me five dinners. All right. The over under is $227 million per year. John Oren, over or under? Oh, that's a great because I would have gone over at two, but 227. I don't know if I'd go over. The MLS thinks they're going to get up around three. I don't think they're going to get close to that. I'll go over 227 because I think they'll throw enough things in there to get as close to three as they possibly can. All right, 227. He's going over. All right, last what one. You're going under, I'm assuming, right? I'm going to go 227 exactly. And if I hit that, <laughs> I hit that. If I hit that, if, if you close that, all the bets. Dinner, <laughs> dinner a week for the rest of the year on me. Yes. Exactly. It closes out all the other bets and I just win. If I get 227 exactly. All right. If Don Garber, if he listens to this podcast, he's probably going to be like, it can't make it 227 because uh, I've been, I look, I've been pretty you know, okay. If you get 227, we'll get Garber as our big get. Oh yeah, that's true. Well, he might be disappointed at 227. Though. He might not want to talk about it. All right. Last one before we move off of the rights. Uh, Formula One, where they end up, get to me pretty quick here. Uh, Formula One, ESPN. Okay. And they've done a great job, as we've talked about before, with Netflix and just like betting on themselves. Yeah. A, a theme here uh, of the pod, 
they went to ESPN, no rights fee. They bet on themselves. They grew. And now ESPN is going to pay handsomely to keep them. There's going to be some competition for it, but they like ESPN. ESPN likes Formula One. It'll stay with ESPN. We move to the topic for will ESPN develop any new stars uh, just because we're talking about it. And then, you know, will A-Rod be back? Uh, so there, there are some questions here to, to, to ask and to answer. Are they going to develop any new stars? I, yeah, I, I'm curious to see what your, your answer is going to be on this. My answer is that every star that they develop is going to be associated with one of its live games or with some sort of uh, in, in like, like a Schefter or a Woj, like an info guy. Because I, I think that that helps market the games year round. Like, like Woj never sleeps, Schefter never sleeps, you know, and, and they're marketing d- d- during the off season as well. ESPN has made over the past several years a strategy decision that they're just going to focus on live games and nothing but live games. And they have, they do have shoulder programming. They, they, and, and it's a big part of what they do, but I, I, they feel that a host of sports center outside of somebody like Van Pelt, but a, just a generic host of sports center, you, you, you can mix and match them pretty easily. So they're, they're spending hard on live games. They're going to try to make that look as, as good as they can expect you know, the the next Monday night football crew to sort of, you know, be somebody that that they really try to develop as stars along the lines of like a Kirk Herbstreet. Yeah, you look at Herb Street, Stephen A. Smith, Scott Van Pelt, Mike, Michael Wilbon, Tony Kornheiser. Those are sort of the big stars that you think they're all not old. And they've been big stars for what, the past that's, decade. Yeah. Exactly. That's the point. So to me, the question for ESPN in this new world, we see what happened with McAfee. We see the gambling space. You know, can they bring Mina Kimes? Has really done something that I don't think really been done before. You know, as a woman analyst, uh, NFL X's and O's, we haven't seen that. Obviously, there's been uh, NFL reporters uh, who come back from the background like I have. You know, as a reporter, and then you become an expert on something uh, in your report. But Mina is more of a analyst, uh, which I, I really I don't think. I, again, there's some Judy Batista at. Uh, uh, NFL Network, somewhat similar, but not really as much X's and O's. So th- that can they bring someone like that or a Marcus Spears to that next level? And, you know, I think with, you know, they obviously love both the, those people. They've been promoting them. But I think ESPN has to ask themselves, how do they bring these people to the next level where they're stars at ESPN and not looking to lead to grow even further? Again, they're both doing well and they're both uh, at the forefront of ESPN. Uh, but I think if you ask me to put money on two people, those would be two that I would say uh, could have even bigger things uh, on the horizon for them. And those are two that ESPN want to keep, no doubt. I really question whether or not they're going to want to get into a, a bidding war for people that aren't like info people against the you know gambling companies or just any other sort of internet companies that, that, that are out there. I, I just, I really question whether they're going to do that. Yeah, and you have to, we have to see if there is really the market for those people in terms of the gambling companies, because we talked about a McAfee who has that organic relationship with YouTube and can reach his audience that way. It's not, for the analyst type, go, it's not as perfect in terms of gambling, in my opinion. Now, is there a way to figure it out? Yes, but it's not, it's not as good. Maybe those people are better at ESPN and then doing side things as well. I mean, you've brought up McAfee a couple of times, you know, big cat. Yeah, they, I don't think they could exist at ESPN, at least not, not currently. They couldn't have grown to where they are at ESPN because they did something completely new and different. And so for, a, for a, a real corporate company like ESPN to sort of like turn and, and, and have a, allow for the, 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 those types of stars to grow, uh, I, it, that's just a big ask for ESPN. I, I just don't see it happening anytime soon. Yeah, and, and I've said this forever. I think to be on the edge, uh, edgy, uh, at ESPN, Disney Company is really hard, especially this day and age with the internet where people can swear and do whatever they want almost. Uh, to be at ESPN where there's going to be rules uh, because of Disney, uh, it's just it's hard to be edgy. Like you're talking about Big Cat uh, and McAfee, et cetera, talk show hosts in general are that way. Um, and if you look at the programming on ESPN radio now, it's not really edgy. There's nobody edgy really on uh ESPN uh, radio. Uh, they're, they're, they're people who are good, but just not necessarily, you know, straddling that line. All right, last one, A-Rod 
very interesting question. Uh, as you know, uh, in New York, uh, and in, A-Rod's a big story always, but uh, will he be back? I do think we'll come back down to um, if Carl Ravich is the play-by-player. Um, I'm not sure that A-Rod is going to go for that. If he's not, does he get someone like Michael Kay, who he likes uh, in there? Uh, then it's possible, but uh, I think Eduardo Perez will also be in the mix. Uh, so uh, that one's interesting to see what happens with A-Rod and ESPN. Give me your percentage. Percentage that A-Rod returns. What do you have it at? I'll go 40-60. So 40% return, 60% does not return. If Carl Ravage is a play-by-play, it goes down to zero or 10? Uh, I don't say zero. I would never say zero with A-Rod. He likes attention. He seems to like doing I don't understand. I just don't get it. Like, I've been around covered A-Rod with the Yankees. Um, we haven't talked in a long time. I don't think he's the biggest fan of, of mine. Though he does read, I've heard. I don't know if, you know, why he'd want to be on the road for 26 weeks if I were Alex Rodriguez. Um but he does. He likes doing it. I think the Fox studio is kind of perfect for him. He's better in small doses and it's more controlled. Uh, the Sunday night, it's not his best thing doing the games. He has like three innings of material for a nine inning game. And that makes it difficult. All right. And then I got one more question for you. Get outside the New York market. Michael K. the odds of him becoming the Sunday night baseball play by play, I have to think are not big. Yeah, I think it comes down to how much they want A-Rod. Um, I think there's a schism to use that old Adam Schefter word uh, at the top. I'm not saying they're at odds, but I do think there are people, uh, executives who really like A-Rod and then others who aren't as fond of A-Rod uh, as the uh, analyst. And so who wins out in that battle, um, I think we'll decide it. And then if they want to really build it around A-Rod, then I think, hey, um, chances do uh, go up. And there are also a question of yes, would even let them do it because he's the Yankee play-by-play guy if, if it uh, opens up a lot of things. So um, yeah, I think Ravage is the favorite. He and Norby Williamson go way back. Um, and I think uh, uh, Norby is the one who is in charge of that, though Jimmy Pitaro obviously is above Norby. So um, Pitaro, big Yankee fan. Yankee fan, yeah. Does he want A-Rod? You know, that's the thing you have to look at there. Um, and so uh that would be interesting, uh, you know, and then, you know, it's because Sunday night, it's a tough, it's a tough booth because people are used to their regular teams and it's basically impossible to really be popular in that slot. Uh, maybe Vince Scully, but Vince Scully, in it, like if it was 30 years ago, people would be like, ah, this guy, he's not my regular announcer. They'd still, they wouldn't like Vince Scully, trust me. Twitter would, Twitter would have found something wrong with Vince Scully. Uh, John Miller had a great run there. Yeah, people ripped him all the time. But yes, John Miller was very good. Yeah, Shulman's great. Look, I still love him in Baltimore. So what can I say? Vescursion was fine. I mean, I, I like those other two better, but Vescursion is a good play. I like. I, all right. Topic five. Do the RSNs disintegrate this year, John? You've been all over this, writing stories about the end of the world for RSNs. Where, where do you see it? No, they're not going to disintegrate. They're not going to dis- disintegrate ever. They're just going to, they're, they're going to change. I can't imagine. I'm still a, a subscriber to the cable bundle. I, I want an R, I want the RSNs. You're going to see a lot more flexibility where distributors are going to have more of a paid tier. Like it'll become almost like an HBO. If, if you want to watch your RSNs, you, you're going to need to uh, spend. Does the price go up for sports fans? Oh, absolutely. It totally goes up. The, this unbundling, the cord cutters, they're making the prices for sports fans go through the roof. What we had it great when we had a cable bundle and we had everybody paying for these sports that were going up, whether they watch them or not. Now, only the people that watch them are going to be paying for them and that's going to make everything go up. But you can see everything. Now, before you could see all your local teams. Now with the new digital world, you could see everything. I grew up a pirate fan. Um, didn't live in Pittsburgh, grew up mostly in Connecticut. You couldn't see the Pirates play unless they were playing the Mets or the Braves on TBS and WOR, those two channels. But and ESPN every once in a while, they stunk most of my childhood. But um, the uh, so they weren't on ESPN that often. Um, before until they got you know Jim Leland, Barry Bonds, etc. You want me to keep going on all this? But the Sammy, <laughs> the Sammy Khalifa years, they weren't on. I, I I have bad memories in 1979 in New York family. Like, yes, yes, I was too. I was that's actually when I first became. I said whoever wins the Super Bowl in the World Series, I was five. 
Those are going to be my two favorite teams. They happen to be the Steelers and the Pirates, and I've always loved Pittsburgh. I, I want to work. Growing up, I want to work at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. That was like my dream. My mom, um, 1979, Game 7. My mom didn't let me stay up to, to see the uh, to see the game. It was a school night. Uh, and so I went to bed, got up, grabbed the Washington Post, and uh, fell into tears. Oh. Uh, it was, oh, it was t- that was a bad morning. Can you imagine me had a DVR? It would have been you guys just woke up, woke up and <laughs> that would have been it. So look, the world's changed. It is more expensive, but you can see every game if you uh, basically anything, uh, at least here in the States. Um, so that's kind of a good thing. All right. Topic six, final topic. World Cup, Beijing Olympics happen this year. The USFL begins again. All right, let's start. World Cup in Qatar. It's in the winter, which is just, it's hard. Do you think there might have been some shenanigans that they ended up in? Oh, no chance. (laughs) They they had a move. It turns out it's too hot in Qatar. Imagine that. For those who don't know, our non-soccer fans out there, they put it in a place, they, they, they assigned it to a place where they can't even have the event when it usually happens because it's too hot. Uh, and FIFA, if you're not aware, they may have been involved in some, uh, uh, what is it called, shenanigans uh, with this stuff. But here we are. Uh, it will be in the winter. It, it's ruining the EPL, the Premier League. All the leagues have to stop. It's ridiculous. All things ridiculous. But what does it mean for Fox and TV? For Fox, Fox should expect ratings to be down big time because all of a sudden instead of of being a nice summer sport where everybody watches it and you go against some regular season baseball now they're going against the nfl they're going against college football they're uh, you know basketball is going to be starting up the nba the competition is going to be huge and they'll still get a nice rating it'll still be a good event but the expect ratings to be down big time yeah i'm trying to look up the time difference in cutter do you know offhand uh, what would it be? I think a, a four o'clock game would be, is it seven hours, eight hours? I'm uh, Googling. All right. Right now, Tuesday. Uh, da, 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 da. This is prime podcast programming right here. We have like, the, we have the Amazon bell. We eight hours. Yeah. It's an eight hour difference. So it's eight hey, hours. That is honest, uh, yeah. So a noon game though, um, be about a thousand degrees there, but it'll be um, a noon game. will be at eight o'clock uh, prime time. So they probably try to get the U S on at noon uh, and in those windows or one, and they, they could they could have something there for for, uh, for Fox and they get the U.S. in prime time. All right. Uh, we go Beijing Olympics. That one's going to be a t- tricky spot for NBC uh, with everything that's going on with China, uh, the Olympics, diplomatic boycott from the U.S. and now other countries um, that is going to be scrutinized. And I don't know really how NBC is going to thread that needle and look good uh, during those Olympics. Yeah, NBC should prepare itself for some tough press because they're not going to be covering uh, the, the the problems over in China as, as hard as they, they probably should. Uh, and NBC really, even when they got these Olympics, they were going to they, they knew they were going to be limping toward uh, 2024 in Paris and then 2028 in L.A. And so the Olymp this is not the death of the Olympics by any means. But but it is a a downturn until they get uh, and, until they get markets and time zones that are really going to work for them. And we haven't even got into the pandemic. Well, you know where that's going to be at that point with the world coming together. Um, we're dealing with Omicron right now, strain, and uh, so yeah, that is going to be a that one's going to be tough. I, the, the more I think about that one, that one's not going to be particularly good. All right, last thing here, USFL. Uh, Fox, it's going to be on Fox, it's going to be on NBC, very good distribution on television. Spring leagues haven't really worked since the USFL, uh, the the original. Uh, What do you think? Let me ask you a question, Andrew. Uh, What's the success in your mind for the USFL? I mean, can we get to five years, 10 years? Can we, can we last oh, a couple five years of years? Is a massive success. I, I have it going to three years and I'm, ta- and I'm saying that that's a success. What happens after three years? I have no idea what, whether they can actually make money off it. Look, I do think they were smart with the nostalgia and like for people like us who uh, were, you know, kind of prime age kids when the USFL with Herschel Walker and Doug Flutie and Jim Kelly and just to go on and on the stars they had and the uniforms. That means I, mean, I already had a USFL, some, some gear before they came back. Yeah. With the first, with the first pick in the USFL draft, the Washington Federals picked Craig James. Oh, yeah. I think the Federals won one game that year, which it might be a reason why they're not coming back. Yeah, I was a Pittsburgh Mauler fan because my Pittsburgh uh, rooting interest, they had uh, Mike Rogier, the, the Heisman Trophy winner. It was a tremendous league. 
That was a tremendous league. Now, they could recreate that and go after. I don't think they're going after the NFL. I just think this is a TV play. Look, I, I think there's a lane. And obviously, people think there's a lane. They keep trying these leagues year after year. They already had this league. They took a year off because of the pandemic. They changed the name to USFL, which, I, like I said, I think is a good move. You know, the XFL was it was losing money but when the pandemic hit. But it was selling out stadiums. The rating, the TV ratings were pretty good. And it, it, it was a pretty good TV product. Whether, whether or not it's good business, I think it'll take a couple of years to tell. All right. Let's move to our calls of the week. Call of the week. I'm going to go first because yours is so big. A blockbuster. Yeah, yours is so big that it has to go last and we'll need a little discussion as we close out things here. So the call of the week um, is more a prediction because obviously we're talking about the future. And mine is ESPN. Will they make a decision with uh, Laura Rutledge and Sam Ponder? I believe Sam Ponder's contract's up. She just does a Sunday NFL countdown. Rutledge does NFL Live, that up-and-coming show. It's done really well uh, with their whole crew, with Dan Orlovsky and uh, the aforementioned Mina Kimes uh, and Marcus Spears, Keyshawn, Ryan Clark. Um, does Laura Rutledge move into that main desk as well? Um, I just think when you look at ESPN, it's more tonnage now than just doing a show a week. So I think that's a question that um, I'm not going to say where they're going to, what they're going to do. Although I'd say Rutledge. So I guess I am going to say what they're going to do. I would say they'll go <laughs> Rutledge. <laughs> Andrew, you're making a prediction and you're saying, I'm not going to say what they're going to do. You got to make the prediction. I know. I know. You're right. Good point. So I said Rutledge. I think it will be Rutledge. Um, I don't like to predict things I might report on. I don't really, cause then it feels like you're kind of, um, going in a different, you know, going in that direction. So I'm not a great fan of that, but I'll put it out there. Laura Rutledge replaces Sam Ponder on that countdown show. All right. That's mine. You want to chime in or let's go to yours. Yours is a blockbuster. Okay. This is not a prediction for 2022. This is a prediction for 2024. There have been a lot of stories that Disney wants to spin off ESPN and where, where there's smoke, there's fire. They've, they've certainly looked into that. It's going to happen at some point. Think 2024, right before the NBA uh, negotiations take place. ESPN desperately wants to keep the NBA. You have some of these big digital companies that want to get the NBA. My call of the year, 2024, Apple wants to get involved. They're going to buy ESPN from Disney. And that's the way that's going to be Apple's entry into sports rather than getting a, a, a deal here or there. They want to, they want to, and they have the pocketbook to, to be able to buy the biggest sports media company there is. And that will be the Apple's entry into sports. It'll jet fuel Apple TV plus Apple will then be the biggest sports media company, including your Amazon in the country. All right. Well, look, I'm hoping we have a flashback in a couple of years where you're right and you get and you nail that. Do I think that? I don't know. All I hear is Apple and Amazon are going to buy everything and then they don't necessarily buy it. They everything. don't. Exactly. They don't. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's not an outlandish prediction. I just don't know why Disney... Like it feels like there's a streaming war game between Netflix, uh, Apple, uh, you know, not and many others. Uh, why Disney would give that advantage to Apple instead of in, in the sports realm instead of keeping it for themselves? Uh, that's that's the only question uh, I have on that. That said, if you were going to sell something, they have kind of been streamlining ESPN, you know, reducing the workforce. Um, getting all the rights, kind of getting everything in order. And so maybe it's in front of us that, yeah, they're going to, they're going to spin that off for what they're doing. Uh, but uh, look, 2024, we, we can flash back to this show and be like, look at Oran, an amazing prediction. In 2024, we'll be making Stephen A money and we'll be, a, <laughs> we can just talk about our predictions and how great they were. Absolutely. I'll be on a beach if that's the case. I'll be there for one year and then I'm out of here. Yeah, Stephen A, why is he still working? He's making all that money. Exactly. I know, he works hard, Stephen A. All right, listen, we've been working hard on this podcast week after week. Uh, we really, really appreciate you listening uh, and becoming a part of it. Uh, and we're looking forward to doing it all next year. No, no weeks off for the podcast. So uh, hopefully uh, you're enjoying this. And most importantly, I hope you are uh, happy and healthy uh, in 2022. Andrew, we're the hardest working podcasters in America. We don't take a week off all the way through. 
Uh, I've really enjoyed doing this. Uh, I think that uh, the, we, we love the business that we cover. I think that comes through. I think it, it's just been a real hoot to get to do this. And I'm really looking forward to 2022. Me too. I'm a little sick of my voice, but besides that, it's, uh, it's all good. <laughs> all right. Thanks, John. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.